All right, engineers, so we're going to talk about how to determine the rate and rhythm um, of EKGs representing SVT and Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome. So, again, how do we do this? Determine the rate. That's your first step. How do we determine the rate? We can go ahead and add up all these R waves and then, again, multiply it by 6. I'm going to be kind of lazy here, and I'm going to find where an R wave kind of lines up with a box, and I find one about right here and the other one about right here. And that's about two boxes, right guys? So I can say here, here's one box, there's the other box, that's two boxes. So what's 300 divided by two boxes is 150 beats per minute. If you guys wanted to, you could go ahead and add up all of the R waves and then again, multiply that by six. That would give you, again, a very quick hand version also. And if we did the rhythm strip, again, go ahead, find one where it kind of like overlaps and lines up from about right there. And it's a little bit less than two boxes, about a box and a half. Okay, so it's in between 300 and 150. So it might be like 250 around that. So let's go ahead and count. Let's do this rhythm. Let's do take the six second strip, multiply the number of R waves by 10. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So it's going to be 19 times 10 is 190 beats per minute. And again, we said it had to be in between 150 and 300. It just happened to be closer to about 200 beats per minute. All right. So that's how we determine that. Now we have the rate. What's our rate? About 150 beats per minute. The next thing we have to do, do is determine the rhythm. How do we determine that? we got to look at our R to R interval. And we have to make sure that they're about the same. And it's best to do this on the rhythm strip, right? So again, make your line about here and about here and about here. And we'll just do a couple of these. We're not going to do all of them. But you want the distance between these contiguous R waves to be about the same number of boxes. And again, if I'm looking here, I got one box, I got a half of one, half of one. So it's about two boxes. Again, I got about a half, a whole, and a half, two boxes. If I continue to keep going down through all of these, they're going to be about two boxes each. And it definitely appears to be so as I move throughout the length of this EKG. They're definitely two boxes. And look, as you get closer over here, they're two boxes consistently. All right? So this is definitely a regular rhythm. So it's regular. Look at the P wave, guys. That's the next step. Where do we look for the P wave? We look in lead two. Ooh. I know that this is my T wave. I am, I don't really see my P wave. It might not be there. It's kind of absent. It might have actually gotten, you know, lost within the QRS complex. I don't completely know. But I know that this is going to be my T wave, and I'm having a hard time seeing where my P wave is. Okay. Well, let's look in the AVR. Let's see if we can see an inverted P wave. Again, I don't see an inverted P wave. Huh. What the heck? I don't have a P wave. So there's no P wave here. So what do I want to do? Remember I told you whenever you have something like this, go into V1 and lead 2 and look to see if you see any kind of F waves, like fibrillatory waves, flutter waves, if you see anything abnormal. So I'm looking here in V1. And again, here's going to be my QRS complex. There's my T wave there. Huh. I don't really see any flutter waves. Again, this is my T wave here. I'm going to look over here. I have my T wave there. I'll just take a look in three, see if I can find something. I see these two little bumps there. Oh, there might be a P wave. I'm not quite sure. So I don't really know. There's just no P wave. I can't really see it. All right, well, let's move on to the next step. Is there a P for every QRS? Well, it's hard to tell because I don't really know if I have a P wave, if it's actually there, if it's not there. If it's lost with inside of the QRS complex, I'm not quite sure. Or if this heart rate is going so fast that the P wave and the T wave are kind of merging together. So it's kind of a little bit difficult to tell. So again, look over here in this rhythm strip here. All I have is my QRS complex, and then it looks like there's just this wave here. And it might be my T wave and my P wave kind of merged together. Kind of difficult to tell. So, okay, next thing we got to move on to is the QRS complex. Is it wide or is it narrow? Well, looking at all of these, these things are like pinpoint. I mean, look at this one. I could obviously go through and say that's one box. I could go through here and say that that one's about one box. These are definitely narrow QRS complexes. So, what have I established from this? I have a, a tacky, so I have a high heart rate. Then I establish that it's also a regular rhythm. 
I also established that it's a narrow QRS complex. What did I tell you anytime you have someone who is tachycardic with a regular rhythm and a narrow QRS complex? You think of three things, all right? You think of sinus tac, right? So again, you think of three things. You think of sinus tac, you think of SVT, and you think of atrial flutter. I looked for the flutter waves, okay? I did not see them in V1, and I didn't see them in lead two. So I don't think it's that. I looked for my P wave, and I looked for uh, it to be upright in lead two and inverted in AVR. I honestly don't see it. Could it be going so fast that it's hard to tell? It's possible. It could be sinus tack. I really don't know. It's hard to tell. Is it SVT? It definitely could be, but again, it's hard to tell. So how do we determine if something is SVT or sinus tack? Well, the best thing to do is let's go ahead and do a vagal maneuver on them. If we do the vagal maneuver on them, it should start to decrease the heart rate. And if you decrease the heart rate, what happens is you separate out that P and that T wave from one another, and you help to be able to distinguish it. If that doesn't work, the next thing you can do is you can give adenosine. And adenosine usually, if the, someone is an SVT, it'll usually knock them out of SVT. Okay. Sometimes it might not be the first dose. It might be the second dose that it has to take to hit them to cause their SVT to actually knock it out. So if the adenosine drops the heart rate enough, then we can most likely say that it's SVT. Okay. In this situation, we're going to hit the patient with adenosine. It's going to slow down and we're definitely going to be able to determine that this is not sinus tachycardia. This is definitely SVT. Okay, so that's what I want you guys to remember. We go ahead, give the adenosine to the patient, or we actually, again, we could do vagal maneuvers, which you could do a carotid sinus massage. You could go ahead and have them breathe through the straw. You can have them do the Valzava's maneuver, where like they're gonna poop themselves. All of those things don't work. You give adenosine six milligrams IV push. If that doesn't work, maybe you have to give more, maybe 12 milligrams. If it starts to drop that heart rate down, then you know that this person is def definitely an SVT. Okay, whereas with sinus tack, you don't need that. You can just give them fluids and they're going to start to, uh, you know, respond pretty well to that. Okay. All right. So that's going to give us SVT. So this one is definitely going to be SVT, which stands for supraventricular tachycardia. Here's the thing that you want to remember. Supraventricular tachycardia, it could come from an ectopic atrial focus or it could come from an ectopic junctional focus. So in other words, some ectopic site within the AV node, so again, AV node, is firing, and it's generating this re-entrant circuit, which we'll talk about in another video when we get into more detail on SVT, um, but it's generating this re-entrant circuit, and this re-entrant circuit continues to fire down into the ventricles, triggering these really high rates or it could be some type of ectopic atrial focus somewhere within the right or left atrium that again is generating this re-entrant circuit and firing that down to the ventricles. So sometimes you might see these written as paroxysmal atrial tachycardia or paroxysmal junctional tachycardia, but they're really hard to distinguish and the treatment of them is pretty much the same. You give adenosine. So we kind of group together PAT and PJT, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, paroxysmal junctional tachycardia, and we just, just call it SVT. All right, so that's going to give us SVT. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so let's go ahead and determine the rate and the rhythm for this EKG here. All right, so how do we start with this? Again, rate. What are we going to do? We can obviously add up all the R waves and multiply it by six. There's not that many in this one, so I can go ahead and do that real quick. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I take 14 R waves, I multiply that by six, and that gives me a total of 84 beats per minute. And again, just remember that that's my ventricular rate. Other ways I could have done it is I could count the boxes. One box, two box, three box. It's about a little bit less than four boxes, so I know it's between three and four boxes. Three boxes, if you guys remember, is 100 beats per minute, and 300 divided by four boxes is 75 beats per minute. So it's somewhere between 75 to 100, and we can go ahead and say it's about 85 beats per minute. So that's how we kind of, uh, again, you can get the difference between those two. All right, 
if we did this one over here, just to be consistent, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have ten total R waves. So if we take ten R waves, multiply it by ten, because again, this is a six second rhythm strip. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's going to give you a hundred beats per minute. And if you wanted to be consistent again, we do the box system. Find one that lands right on it. One, two, three. 300 divided by 3 is 100 beats per minute. So again, that's how we calculate our rate. So we know that for this 12 lead EKG, it's approximately 84 beats per minute. All right, so if we go ahead and look at our R to R interval, again, you're just looking from this point to this point. It's about a little bit more than three boxes. And again, here we're going to have one box, two box, three box, a little bit more. Again, over here, if we compare over here, it's about one two, three, a little bit more than that. One, two, three, a little bit more than that. And again, we could just keep going. These are about just a little bit more than three boxes. So I'd say that this one is pretty, pretty regular. Uh, it might be just slightly on the verge of irregular, but I'd say that it's for the most part regular. What's the next thing we do, guys? Next thing we do is we determine the P wave. Is it upright in lead two, inverted in AVR? Let's go to lead two. Ooh, that's definitely a P wave. That's definitely a P wave. That's definitely a P wave, and it's definitely pointing upwards. That's a good sign. I look in AVR. Okay, there's AVR. It's definitely flipped. It's inverted. Ooh, Mama Juju, this is sinus. So we know that this is sinus, and that means what? That we know that the SA node is firing and sending action potentials down to the AV node. All right, cool. Is every P wave followed by a QRS complex? Well, here's my P, Q, R, S, T. So P, Q, R, S, and then the T, P, Q, R, S, T. I got a P, Q, R, S, and a T. And I can just keep going along. There's definitely a P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. And as I go along, there's definitely, for every P, there, there definitely is a Q, R, S complex. So there is AV association here. All right, sweet deal. Next thing we do, do, do is determine to do is determine the actual QRS complex. Is it wide? Is it narrow? Well, these QRS complexes, I mean, obviously, just take a look at them. They're they're definitely wide. There's no doubt about it. So I'd say that these are wide QRS complexes for sure. And again, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty of these, you can. But just kind of looking right here, I'd say that that's one box, two box, three box just a little bit more than three boxes. And again, that's greater than 0.12 seconds. That's a wide QRS complex. Here's the next thing that you wanna do. Anytime you have someone that has regular, okay, R to R intervals, they do have sinus P waves, and you see a wide QRS complex, the next thing you should do, just for the heck of it, if you want to, take a look at the PR interval, okay? I'm looking at my PR interval here, boys and girls, and I'm I'm seeing here a very, very tiny PR interval. Like, it is so minuscule. That is a tiny little PR interval. So I have a short PR interval. So a short PR interval. Okay? That's, that's, that's interesting. Here's the next thing you want to do. If you see someone that has a short PR interval, they have wide QRS complexes, the next thing you want to do is also look at the going upwards. So look here. You see how I go from the P wave and then I slur upwards like this. That's slurring upwards. That's called a delta wave. So I also have a delta wave. So I have a short PR interval. I have a QRS that's actually a wide QRS. What's another thing? I have T wave inversions. So I have some, some slight ST segment depression and some T wave inversions. So if you also see some slight ST segment depression and T wave inversion, that's also all indicative of Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. And the most common type of Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome is type A. Now, just to give you a tiny little bit on the pathophysiology, we're not going to go super hardcore on this. I just want you to understand a little bit about what's going on here. So if we imagine here, you have in Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome, 
they have this little piece of tissue here and it's usually along between the left atrium and the left ventricle and it's a special like electrical tissue that can be very excitable it's called the bundle of Kent and what happens is remember the SA node and then here you have your AV node right and again the AV node sends your action potentials down the bundle branches and into the Purkinje system when action potentials are being fired remember it fires throughout the entire atria through the internodal pathways and through Bachmann's bundle and again that travels all the way out here to the left atrium as well but eventually all of it is supposed to come onto the AV node and he sends the action potentials down to the ventricle he's your gatekeeper in other, other words right there's no other way to get electrical uh, impulses down to the ventricles unless you go through this dude except for in wolf parkinson's white syndrome they have some a tissue that's very similar to the av node and that when action potentials reach this part of the atria guess what it can do it can conduct action potentials down into the ventricles when it conducts these action potentials down to the ventricles that allows for these ventricles to be pre-excited and because it excites this actual ventricle a little bit earlier when the ventricles uh, receive the impulses coming down from the av node what happens is this ventricle is already depolarized early and then as it's already depolarized it kind of moves over to the right ventricle so what happens with this is you actually get what's called right axis deviation again we'll talk about this a little bit more but because it's actually causing this depolarization to move and it's taking a lot longer it's actually going to cause that widening of the qrs complex so you get pre-excitation right axis deviation a wide qrs complex and the reason why you get that delta wave is because the pr interval is a lot shorter because what happens is once these action potentials start moving towards the av node and towards that bundle of kent the bundle of kent sends it down so the time between sa node firing and the ventricles beginning to depolarize is a lot sooner because of this dude right there that bundle of kent so whenever somebody has this the best thing to do that you have to remember you have to remember your a b c d's if you have someone with wolf parkinson's white syndrome especially if they also have afib too so if someone has afib and wolf parkinson's white syndrome you never ever ever give them a adenosine you never give them b a beta blocker you never give them c a calcium channel blocker you never give them d digoxin this can prove fatal because why you you're inhibiting this av node if you're inhibiting the AV node, where's all the action potential is going to go to now? It's going to go right through that bundle of Kent. And what's going to happen is you're going to have this develop a reentrant circuit. And this can quickly, quickly, quickly turn into VTAC or VFib and become very fatal for the person. So it's obviously important that you give another type of medication, um, one that they call amiodarone. Amiodarone. This is one of the big ones. Another one is called procainamide. Um, so these are two medications that you can give to a person who does have Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. But obviously the best treatment that you could do here is to just destroy that bundle of Kent. Get rid of it so it doesn't conduct action potentials. And they call that radiofrequency ablation. Okay, so that's important to remember for someone with Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. Hi, right, Nishner. So in this video, we talked about supraventricular tachycardia, which we remember we talked is proxismal atrial tachycardia and also proxismal junctional tachycardia. But they're difficult to distinguish, and so we just call them together SVT. We also talked about Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome, which we also can refer to as AVRT, atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. It's a specific type of SVT. I hope you guys did like this video. I hope you learned a lot. If you guys did, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Check out our Facebook, our Instagram, and even our Patreon account. If you guys have the opportunity to donate a dollar, we would truly appreciate that. Thank you guys so much for being such great ninja nerds. We'll see you guys in the next video. And as always, until next time.